one half of the operating table is removed. The patient is positioned on the remaining part of the table as close as possible to the surgeon in a decubitus lateral position. Both knees are slightly flexed and the patient is stabilized with support to the symphysis and to the sacrum. The surgeon is positioned ventral to the patient. Three landmarks are required. The tip of the greater trochanter, the tuberculum innominatum, and the superior anterior iliac crest. Identify the tip of the greater trochanter and the superior anterior iliac crest. Draw a line from the midpoint between the tip of the greater trochanter and the tuberculum innominatum to the antero superior iliac crest. Define the initial incision. This runs from the border of the trochanter and extends approximately 6 to 8 centimeters along the guideline. It will mark a plane that defines the femoral neck axis. Make an initial skin incision and then divide the fatty layer in line with the incision. Lift the skin and undermine the fatty layer to create a mobile window sufficient to expose the capsule but not so extensive as to risk necroses of subcutaneous tissue. The femoral cutaneous nerve is ventral to and well away from the exposure. With the fascia exposed, palpate the underlying plane between the tensor fascia lata and the iliotibial band. It is here that the fascia is of sufficient thickness to allow closure at the end of the procedure. Incise the fascia, approximately 2 to 5 millimeters medial to the underlying border of fascia lata, following the direction of skin incision. Use scissors and blunt dissection to separate the tensor fascia lata ventrally from the fascia, following the plane of incision down to the capsule of the femoral neck. Insert a straight Hohmann retractor between the tensor fascia lata and the sartorius muscle with the tip coming to rest on the femoral neck at the bottom of the greater trochanter. Retract the tensor laterally together with the abductor minimus and medius muscles. Use a second retractor on the femoral calcar to retract the sartorius and rectus muscles ventrally. This will expose the capsule over the femoral neck. Make a T-shaped capsular incision, inferior to superior, and along the border of the greater trochanter. Lift the capsule away from the bone, using a rasp if necessary. Suture and reflect both flaps, ready for reattachment. Use a long, narrow saw blade to resect the femoral neck in two osteotomy lines along the capsule without luxating the hip. After completing the osteotomy, a chisel is used to flip the femoral neck toward the front. This will allow a corkscrew to be introduced into the femoral head. Follow the central axis of the femoral neck into the head, not into the neck. Turn the corkscrew several times and remove the femoral head. Once the head has been resected and extracted from the wound, turn to the acetabulum and remove any remaining labrum. Put a third double bent retractor beneath the femur and move the femur distally to provide good visualization for acetabular and femoral reaming. Using the smallest reamer attached to the 45 degree driver introduced perpendicular to the table, ream the acetabulum holding close to the transverse ligament. Once the acetabulum has been deepened to the level determined during preoperative templating, the reamer size is sequentially increased in 1 to 2 millimeter increments. Reaming stops when the socket has become a true hemisphere and when the reamer makes contact with the anterior and posterior walls of the acetabulum. Following preparation of the acetabulum, a trial shell 1 to 2 millimeters larger in diameter than the last reamer is attached to the threaded connector of the acetabular inserter. The trial is introduced to the acetabulum. Appropriate trial shell orientation can be verified with external alignment guides 
in addition to natural landmarks such as the transverse ligament. The trial is used to assess the coverage of the acetabular component and to gauge the seating depth of the actual cup. The definitive acetabular shell is attached to the threaded connector of the acetabular inserter. The shell is introduced into the acetabulum and impacted in place. Remove all soft tissue from the face of the shell so as not to impede liner seating. Prior to inserting the final acetabular liner, thoroughly irrigate and clean the shell. Select the correct sized liner inserter head and attach it to the acetabular inserter. Final impaction into the shell is completed using the acetabular inserter and the correct sized liner inserter head. The leg is then flexed, abducted, externally rotated and placed in a bag. A spoon-shaped curette is used to open up the femoral cavity. It is brought in line with the lateral cortex to determine the natural axis of the femoral stem. It is important to note that the brooches should be in neutral alignment when parallel to the table. The lower leg should be parallel to the table in order to accurately define a zero degree alignment. The Karai femoral component is usually inserted with approximately six to eight degrees of antiversion. Beginning with the smallest brooch attached to the brooch handle, the medullary cavity is progressively enlarged until the level of the neck resection is reached. The depth of the implant, established during femoral planning, is measured in relation to the greater trochanter using a needle to find the exact height of the greater trochanter. Broaching should continue until complete stability is achieved. The size of each brooch matches the corresponding implant without HA coating. The definitive stem is the same size as the last brooch used. The implant is introduced and impacted into the canal using the femoral component impactor and aligned in the central axis of the femur to the level of the HA coating. Place the appropriate femoral head onto the taper, reduce the hip and perform a final stability check. The capsule is adducted using the initial holding sutures and closed with three single stitches. The fascia tractus iliotibialis is closed using several stitches. No muscle has been cut or divided. The visualization of the joint is excellent and the implants have been accurately positioned and aligned to restore joint stability with a full range of motion through an incision of only 6 to 8 centimeters.